Hey, what's up everyone? It's Joe from Gadget Tech, and I'm gonna do something different today. So um, I went to CanJam. I think I mentioned it in my last review, but uh, it was a huge headphone show out in SoCal. It was in Irvine, and I got to see some amazing products, listen to a lot of awesome stuff, and I think most importantly, meet a lot of awesome people, both on the brand side and new listeners to headphones, people who have been in the industry, got to meet some amazing YouTubers um, that have been doing this for a long time. So it was a fun experience. Now I had some takeaways. I went and sought out some people I had worked with in the past to catch up with them and their company, kind of see how things are going. Um, and I also got to meet some new brands, which is really exciting for the channel because I think I'm gonna have a lot of really cool content that in the past, I don't think we would have been doing. So um, the point of this review, it's a can jam summary based off my experience. So there were, if I tried covering all the things that I experienced and enjoyed, uh, this video would be at least a couple hours. Honestly, there's just so much to do and experience, but uh, there's some things that stood out. So I have some notes to help me stay on track because I tend to talk a lot, uh, but I just want to share some updates with you. So one thing I was excited about um, and I just reviewed recently was the EF400 amp from Hi-Fi Man. It's a $600 R2R amp. Um, it uses their Himalaya DAC found in the Deva Pro, which I'll be reviewing soon. But basically for $600, it gives you a lot of power. It has USB and um, it has a unique sound signature to it, which I think is nice because there are a lot of really good Delta Sigma based DACs. So ESS, AKM, you know, brands, and those are the DAC size. Obviously you get brands that use that. Um, but I like that for $600, you just get something different. So I just wanted to mention that it was at the show. They had like 10 of them on display and it was powering, you know, the you know, HE400s, the Sundaras, and then all the way up to Sosparas and beyond. So it has a lot of potential to power a huge range of headphones. And a lot of people were bringing their own headphones to listen to it just to see what it sounded like, which was really cool. Now, another exciting launch, at least to me, was the Focal Utopia 2022 edition. Uh, it's a gorgeous headphone. The old Utopia was still one of my favorite looking headphones. And I actually think they made it look even better with the new color wash. Admittedly, these just launched, so the demo units at the Focal booth weren't really burnt in yet fully, so I think it could have sounded a little bit more harsh than it would over time. The listening floor was a bit loud, so it was really hard to properly demo them on the floor, and I think that's where most people were trying to listen to it. It's a noisier environment. However, there is the DCS audio room, uh, and I talk about the DCS stack here shortly, because that will lead up to it. Um, they had a Utopia 2022 edition there, and those two together were something else. Now, I know the DCS DAC is exceptional. It should be because it's, you know, $27,000, $30,000 amp stack, you know, separate components for your clock, DAC, and amplifier. Um, but it felt like it really released the potential of the Utopia, um, which I think the 2022 edition is slightly more subtle on the treble range than what I remembered on the older Utopia. Um, I don't wanna say for sure because one, limited listening time, and um, I couldn't AB them on the same stack. But it, I actually really liked the sound. It had great dynamics to it, extremely comfortable, and it's gorgeous. Now the price did go up with the 2022 version. It now sells for $5,000. Whether that's worth it to you or to the general community is another story, but that will come in time. I don't wanna give feedback because it's it's too early, realistically. I think it's uh, it sounds as good as it looks um, and it's stunning. I honestly, for my preference, I really enjoyed listening to it and I can't wait to get my hands on them again. So I mentioned the Utopia is being connected to the DCS stack, the Lena stack. Holy hell, that stack was amazing. It's a $30,000 setup, basically, once you're getting it home to your door. That includes an amp, a master clock, and the DAC. The DAC is the most expensive piece. I think it sells for about $12,000 by itself, um, but it's a very unique product. It makes a statement, and that statement is, I have ascended. I found that almost everything sounded good on this stack. Naturally, there are some headphones that I think worked better with different amp pairings, mainly due to their sonic signature and my own personal preference. What was really cool about the Lena stack is you could actually turn the master clock on and off without having to disconnect anything or stop your music. Now it took a few seconds for when you enabled the master clock for everything to sync back up again, but I couldn't believe that it made a noticeable difference. I, I haven't really been a huge believer in a master clock system, partly because I'm like, how much of a difference can that possibly make? And also because I've never really heard a proper setup of it before. And the detail retrieval, the natural detail retrieval it made 
which was noticeable even on the Utopias, which, I mean, it's a $5,000 headphone. I shouldn't say even, but a $5,000 headphone on a $30,000 stack, uh, you put them together and it was shocking how much you get out of a stack like that. And it was never doing this extra detail retrieval in a sense of making things sharper or more harsh. It's just the subtle dynamics are conveyed better with the master clock. And it's almost like it's extending the resolution of any headphone that was plugged into it. It just blew me away. Now on the technical side, what's unique about the DCS stack is it uses something called a ring DAC, which is similar to an R2R DAC, but it's their own implementation. It's different than Delta Sigma DACs again, so nothing like AKM or ESS or Burr Brown, anything like that. Um, but what I thought made the Lena DAC so unique and interesting to learn about, it's so much so that I may do a dedicated video on the Lena. Um, they use an FPGA system, so there's actually a processor inside that will check the resistor's performance because a, a resistor or R2R DAC technology, and in this case, it's a ring DAC, when you have a lot of resistors, not every single resistor is going to have the exact same performance. It's almost impossible. They try to get to a really narrow tolerance, and that's part of why this, this costs what it does. But the FPGA system is actually a little computer chip that's constantly monitoring the resistor's performance and altering the signal chain to compensate for the resistor's performance in real time. So you will never have a resistor impacting in any negative way the sound quality coming out of the DAC. Um, it's just some really crazy black voodoo type stuff. I don't know if that'll ever trickle down to more affordable gear down the road, but it was really, really cool. And again, like I said, I, I, I could notice the difference. It was an apparent difference with that clock enabled and just using that stack was so, so smooth and just sounded amazing when everything plugged into it. There's another headphone that stood out to me and partly because of the amp pairing, but it was really unique on the design and sound quality. And that was the T plus A Solitaire P headphone. Um, this is not a cheap or inexpensive headphone. It's $7,000 but it has some unique design elements to it. The planar magnetic drivers are rated from five hertz to 54,000 hertz, and they have the unique magnet structure, which actually keeps the magnets only on the outer part of the driver. Um, I've been a huge fan of some hi-fi med headphones. Here's the HE-1000 SE, and they switch to stealth magnets, and the reason why they switch to stealth magnets, they, they change the shape and size of them so they can be more acoustically transparent because they have magnets on both sides of the planar magnetic transducer, which is a really, really thin film, so thin that in a, you know, if you dropped it in a room, it would basically just kind of float. Um, it's that thin. So what was really cool is T plus A has this headphone that has no magnets on the inner side, so nothing between the, the driver and your ear. So totally unaltered sound. Now, thankfully the build quality is top notch and I was hoping it would be good because let's face it, $7,000 is a steep price tag. T plus A is a German brand. It competes directly with Europe. It's actually extremely popular in Europe, um, but I think they're looking to grow their brand in the US. So I would expect to see more of their stuff in the future, especially if they keep releasing more affordable models, which they're already doing so. I just wanted to bring up the Solitaire P because that detail retrieval and hyper energy resolution really, it presented music in a different way. Now, some people may or may not like that, and that's fine. I think it's important that you have to an extent, headphones that have unique sonic characteristics. Because one, you could be in the mood for a different sound, or two, you might just have different hearing preferences or the way your ear is picking things up. So you need a variety of headphones out there. But I think what made that Solitaire P special is the amount of detail retrieval it was able to convey. It's, it's in crazy fast when it comes to transients and replicating every subtle nuance of the recording. So it's a hyper analytical, slightly forward and bright sounding headphone. Now, another product that stood out to me was the Sentrance DAC Mini, mainly because of its shape. You know, there's different things that you walk by and it gets to a point where some stuff looks the same. The Sentrance DAC Mini was unique because it's shaped just like a Mac Mini or a Mac Studio, and it can stack perfectly on top. And you would think it's an Apple product for the way it looks. Now it has a lot of capability and power in potential. Um, I think it, it's 1.5 watts at 32 ohms. So it's not crazy powerful, but you can drive most headphones with that as long as you're sensitive enough. If not, he also makes, he, the uh, Michael, the CEO, they have a uh, 
amp mini that can also stack. So if you need some serious power, you can do that. But uh, I liked it because it gave you a lot of different controls and options to kind of work with it. A lot of people use Mac minis and studios obviously for content creation. So giving you a good audio solution, which is really important, uh, that also blends well with your desk because now you have a super clean aesthetic on your desk. Um, I think that's super awesome. And people might get it solely because of the looks in addition to coming from a company that has a reputation in the industry for pro audio. So um, I'm really excited to see what that does to the market and I'm hoping to get my hands on it one day and, and actually check the performance because I think it's beautiful even by itself. Now it's time to talk about Warwick Acoustics because this was a showstopper for two reasons. For one, they were the only one in the entire showroom floor, the main listening floor, that had a sound isolation booth. It was basically like a giant foam booth that was shaped much prettier than a foam booth that had two seats for two of their systems that they brought. Um, the second reason why it was a showstopper is the sound quality and I suppose price tag. So the unit starts at $32,000. That's the Aperio system. And if you get it in a 24 karat gold variant, it's $44,000. So naturally this is gonna stand out because it's a super high-end product. I think the Aperio produced even more so than the T plus A. The Aperio produced some of the best resolution I've ever heard on any headphone I can recall. It helped that it was in a quiet room because I was able to appreciate those detail differences more. If I was in a noisy floor, I don't think it would have stood out as much. Just would have been a very expensive setup. I wish I could have had more time with it, but as soon as you put them on, it's immediately apparent how much power and control this system had, even when listening to a track for the very first time. Some headphones, you have to listen to a few songs to kind of get a feel for it. Is it sibling? Is it lazy? Is it hazy? There's all these different characteristics to listen to, um, but you could tell immediately after hitting play that this has a very interesting and capable presentation of music. It just just immediately made itself known. So I think, um, you know, maybe one day I'll have more coverage on this. Who knows if I'll get my hands on one down the road, but it became apparent how cool that system was. And uh, it's not like you're just spending that money for a luxury looking item. They put so much of that cost into the performance. I think it runs at 1900 volts or something like that. It's a their own technology, but it's similar to you know, electrostatic uh, speaker, so electrostatic. I don't know if I said electric, but it's pretty awesome. Definitely read into it. I'll put a link in the description for all the sites of all these brands I'm talking about. All right, another one that I remember very, very clearly is the ZMF Caldera. Um, it is ZMF's first planar magnetic headphone, uh, and I didn't know what to expect. I, I like certain I find in planar magnetic headphones. I like Odyssey planar magnetics. So what was ZMF going to bring? Someone known for making really beautiful and great performing, well-made dynamic driver headphones. So it was, it, it's kind of insane because I, I granted these were connected to some of the best amps. They had an amp from DCS there. So the whole Lena stack was there connected to it. There was an amp, a prototype amp from the guy, Lord Gwyn on HeadFi um, that just is a tube system. It sounded amazing. Um, but I couldn't believe that their first planar magnetic headphone sounded as good as it did. It had, it had warmth, it had detail, it had treble that was like, you know, a little bit emphasized, a little bit more forward than a t traditional dynamic driver with, that's tuned more to the Harman curve. But it was still, a, it kind of still adhered closer to the ZMF house sound, but in a planar magnetic way doing things only a planar magnetic could, especially when it came to your transients and, and resolution and stuff. So um, I honestly, it might've been one of my favorite headphones for the money period at the show. Uh, I listened to a lot of songs on there, um, stuff from Radiohead. I listened to uh, even, you know, obviously Daft Punk, uh, Random Access Memories is like the go-to with a lot of testing for me. I just seriously loved everything I played on it. It was so comfortable and just like, as is ZMF with everything else, it was also a beautiful headphone. So stay tuned, I'm, I'm doing what I can to get one because if I don't get one for review, I'm really considering buying one because it's just such a, a beautiful, beautiful headphone. So I strongly suggest checking out their website, maybe look at some other reviews to learn more about it. I'm gonna do a quick mention to VZR because they were there again. Now VZR Audio is a gaming headset brand at an audiophile show, which is a very risky move 
Uh, if you talk to a lot of audiophile type people and you mention gaming, they will cringe at that very word because they don't believe that can go hand in hand. So Vic and Michael from VZR, they're the founders and owners of VZR. They wanted to provide some, you know, genius level engineering to a headphone that has a good mic. And I'm bringing them up because one, I got to give them props. And what was really cool, I'm not just saying this because I worked with them in the past, I saw people buying their headphones at the show. They were listening to them there. This is an audiophile show that has stuff from, you know, under 200 bucks to 30 to $40,000 and people are buying the Model 1. So I think that shows you just how well received I think this headphone or headset is becoming. And I brought them up on this video because they made a couple little tweaks. They have the new versions of the Model 1. So if you buy after this video, they have a longer mic boom. And I know they're looking at different uh, cords with different impedance ratings to increase sensitivity. So the mic setup works amazing on Xbox now, whereas on my original review, the mic was a little bit quieter. So I'm really excited to see that they're iterating through and, and improving the Model 1. And um, I'm not letting any cats out of the bag, but I got to experience some prototype stuff they're doing for down the road. And I am really excited for Model 1. I think they're really gonna keep making a big scene on the gaming side and you can just pop the mic off and now you have good headphones too. So big shout out to the success. I'm glad to see that they're improving and people are, are receiving it well. So we're near the end of the video. I only have a few more products to cover. Two of them both come from Odyssey, maybe three depending on how I bring this up. But now when I went to the Odyssey table, it's because I was dying to try the new MM500 planar magnetic headphone, sub $2,000 planar magnetic. Really excited because it was a new product, a lot of hype. Um, that will be the second headphone I discussed though, because when I asked for it, they said that all of them were being listened to by other people. And they had a huge setup there, you know, like a U-shaped, multiple tables, multiple amps and cans. And so they asked if I wanted to just take a seat and listen to a different headphone while I waited. I'm like, sure, why not? So I listened to the Carbon, which I knew a little bit about, but never really listened to for a long period of time, or I never listened to it before, I just vaguely knew about it. So I plugged it in, and the Carbon is Odyssey's electrostatic headphone. It's not a planar magnetic. The electrostatic requires a different type of amp technology, which they paired it with a beautiful amplifier. Um, I don't even know how to say it correctly. It's, um, it's from Europe. I'll put a, a link uh, in the description below. Um, but it blew me away. And the way the carbon retrieves detail, it still had somewhat of an Odyssey sound as far as like a little bit of the darkness and intimacy up top in the treble. But the electrostatic has a very unique presentation in the mid-range and low to, to mid treble as far as the speed, detail, retrieval, and forwardness. Um, I felt like they did a really good job. I was surprised because I'm not normally a huge fan of electrostatic speakers or headphones because of the sub bass issues. They typically don't have a lot of sub bass extension. These had a surprising amount of sub bass, but um, just the way they had it tuned, I, I found, I actually, so here's the thing. I was enjoying the carbon so much that when the MM500 became available, I said I needed more time with the carbon and I ended up sitting at the table. There's a few headphones at the show that I really sat down and listened to once I got to listen to it on the right setup. That uh, was the ZMF, the Utopia, this uh, for sure. Um, but I, I felt more emotional connection to some of the music because I didn't expect it to sound as good or the way it did. So even though it's not a brand new launch, the carbon to me was a special experience. Um, and if you're ever near an audio store that sells it or you can find one used, which lowers the risk because you can always resell it if you don't like it. Um, however you want to try it, just try to audition it with the right, you know, a good amp. Uh, and it's a pretty rewarding experience. Really, really loved it. Plus, it's a beautiful headphone. So once I finally decided I was using too much of my day listening to the Carbons, I was able to listen to the MM500, and that weight was worth it. Um, it's a totally different tune than the Odyssey House Planar tune, you know, with the emphasized bass and a little bit darker highs. It is a much more neutral, almost, I don't wanna say perfectly neutral, because nothing is, but it's a very, very neutral headphone. Still had a more forward emphasized upper mid-range treble region. You know, when you get from 2000 to 5000 Hertz, it obviously picks back up there but not as aggressively as some other headphones in this price range. 
Um, I was shocked at how different it sounded from every other Odyssey headphone I ever tried, but it was extremely comfortable. It was again sub $2,000, relatively easy to drive it seemed. It was it got really loud on, on several amps I was trying it on. And I think that they're gonna have, I think that model is going to be really popular um, throughout the year. Cause again, as word comes out and you see more people talking about it, and generally it's gonna have a positive e experience with people because it's a plan R that's tuned fairly well. Um, and it's a little bit more neutral. So you can listen to it with everything. You can always EQ it to your liking. So I, I really loved that headphone. I was more surprised by the carbon um, because I wasn't ready for that. And I was expecting good things from the MM500 and I, I got good things back. It was just totally different than anything I had heard of. So Meze came out with the 109 Pro uh, open back just in the past month. This is the 99 Classic. So maybe one day, I will get the Pro open back. In fact, I think something is showing up for Meze later this week. I just have to double check because I don't know what is coming. However, I did get to play with it there and I thought, I'm trying to think of the best way to describe it. So it is like no other Meze headphone I've ever heard. Um, now I, I don't own any other Meze products outside of the 99 Classic, but I listened to the Elite a lot last year and the Elite was one of my favorite headphones last year because I just loved the the way it handled the bass. It's such a dynamic, warm, di uh, closed back headphone. Um, 109 Pro, nothing like anything I've heard from them. Much more open, much more bright sounding, much more neutral on the bass and not the emphasized, in some cases, overly warm bass that you have with some other Meze headphones. Um, and it was at the price range of $800 um, I think it's going to be a big hit because it still has these stunning looks. So the 109 Pro looks a, even better than the 99 Classic, which it should because it's more, but this is already a, a really nice looking headphone and they improved on it. It's a beautiful headphone. They have the exposed driver inside the ear cup and it sounded amazing. Um, I think sub 1000 is a really important category because you're stepping up into super high end audio, audiophile tier grade stuff without getting into the, the multi-thousand dollar range that is a bit jarring and frankly out of reach for a lot of people. So I really like the sub thousand dollar category and what some of these brands bring and I think the 109 Pro is gonna be popular, mainly because as I'm cruising around on the floor listening to different stuff, I heard the 109 Pro talked about by other people when they're in passing talking to each other about stuff they listen to. The 109 Pro got brought up all the time. So I think it's gonna be a big hit and you're gonna see again, a lot more of that headphone down the road. Whether it's for everyone, that's a different story, but it's nice that there's something different coming from Meze as far as sound signatures go. The last product I wanna talk about is from a company called Socris. Um, the main engineer, Soren, he's made some incredible amps and DACs in the past. Um, he has very high quality DACs from a musicality standpoint and value. And he has some R2R decks. This is a theme here. I, I don't know, I didn't even mean for a lot of this discussion to be on R2R, it just kind of happened that way. Um, but he makes really good R2R decks and there's a new one coming out, the DAC 1221. It's a compact DAC that's just barely larger than a JDS Labs Atom, so it's not that big. R2R and it's under 500 bucks, coming from a company known to make incredible R2R decks. Now, I don't know how they'll stack up against their more expensive ones or other brands like the Aries 2 um, from Denifrips, but the fact that you can get a really high quality R2R from a reputable company with a reputation for making amazing DACs in their respective price points, um, that could be a big hit too. I don't know, but it was something that stood out to me mainly because of the form factor and the price. And he actually took the lid off for me and I talked to the, the owner, uh, Soren himself, is really cool dude and they showed the inner workings of it and how we had it all laid out uh, and it's amazing how they were able to fit so much in a small chassis so um, I guess that's the end of this video this was probably longer than I anticipated but I had so many amazing experiences there uh, there's some other YouTube channels that are big and those guys are so nice so I'm gonna do a thanks to Resolve, DMS, Kryn, um, I got to talk to some of the big guys there and I couldn't believe how approachable and supportive they were. So if you guys ever watch this video, one, thanks. Um, and it's been a pleasure uh, being able to pick your brains 
And as to all the brands who took hours and hours of time talking to me about stuff, thank you for that. Thank you to everyone that uh, supports the channel and watch this to learn about some new and exciting stuff or things you may already know about. With that being said, don't forget to like and subscribe. I have tons of audio stuff coming, so just you wait and see what's in store for the rest of this year. I'll see you next time. Bye.